I'd like to welcome you to the Lord's house this morning. It's good to be here, just to see the children sing and uh, to be with them all week. It was a blessing to be here with them. And uh, what we're planning to do this morning is just a celebration of God's creation. And so I will be doing a slideshow and just showing some pictures and facts of what God has created and and what God's word has said about himself and how he has created things and why he has done things. And it was a blessing this week to be together with the children and just see them sing. And, and uh, I was just thinking that in some ways I think that there is some truth to evolution. Because whenever the children sing, they sing really loud. It got so loud in here I had to go sit in the back rows. Uh, the last uh, few meetings we were talking about putting some steel plates on the back of the chairs so that we had more sound in here. And so I think uh, children, they sing really loud, and the older we get, it it evolves into quieter singing. And so I think we need to go back to singing like children. The Bible does say we need to become like children. So, But it was a blessing. It's a lot of work, but it's also a blessing to be uh, with the VBS children all week. And I was actually really excited um, for this, I was, I was doing a series on uh, Colossians, but um, I had a, this urge to, to do a creation message uh, this morning. It fits with what we have here. And so my favorite animal here on this uh, stage is that fox right there up on the cliff. And I don't know why, but I just thought it was kind of neat to have a fox pick, sticking his head out of a cliff there. So, so for me, it was a blessing just to be here during the week. Um, a lot of energy goes into it, but uh, I think about the creativity and everything that the, the VBS committee had took them about 15 hours to put the stage together like this. When we think about creation, God created the heavens and the earth in seven or in six days, and re- on the seventh day he rested. And we think about the detail work and the imagination uh, that God has, um, like it has in the bulletin, that, that God's... God's imagination is equal to his creativity. And so when you ever think about um, something you've seen, how God, is, how God cre- is, has created, you have to understand that God's imagination is even greater. I think if he wanted to, he could create even more things and things that would just blow our minds. And I'll be sharing a few things today that I found, and I always have found creation to be interesting. The more you dig into creation, the more interesting it becomes, the detail work of who God is. And uh, so I have several books at home on creation, what God has created on human beings, on animals, on, on nature, even the clock of the earth and everything. It's very interesting to see um, how God has made everything, even weather patterns and how it all works together. It's just fascinating. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. And the first part here is we see here in Psalm 90 verse 14. And this is the psalmist, and he says, Lord, satisfy us in the morning with all your unfailing love. And we think about God. He is, in, uh, he is an all-knowing, all-seeing, ever-present, all-capable God, and that his love never runs out. And this morning for us to come together and to understand that God will never run out of love. And uh, when we think about when the rivers, they all run into the sea, and as the scriptures say, and yet the sea is not full. God has this perfect ecosystem on how everything moves and consists. And at the same time, God's love will never run out. And so we see here, and this is we got in the first week of uh, Colossians. And we see in Colossians 1 verse 16, it says, For by him were all things created that are in the heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. So when we think about this, we stop right there, it says invisible. So God has created things that are invisible, things that we cannot see. And so the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And so faith is simply when we have a moral, con- we are morally convinced that the unseen things are real because it is impossible for God to lie. It says whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. Any time you miss that last part that we are created for him, your life is going to reel out of control. When you start to be self-focused, you focus on your life, 
And when you get hurt and you ask God, why? Why this? Why me? It's all about you. You get offended at God. But when you realize you have been created for him and whether you get hurt or not, God is still there for you. His love never fails. And so when you continue to live your life for God, realizing that no matter how things hurt you in life, you continue to live for God, you will always pull out of it the best that you, the best right there. So, and when we think about the very beginning, it says here in the very beginning, God created. And when we think about created, that the things did not exist. Years ago, I saw this comic, and it was a uh, scientist that, that knew how to make all kinds of things. And he says that, uh, yeah, God created things, but we, can, we as scientists created things too. And he says, all right, I want you to create something. And the scientist went to get his supplies, and God says, no, 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 just a minute. You make your own supplies. You don't use anything I made. You start with your own. And so when you think about it that way, you realize that man cannot do anything without something that God has already created. And so when we look at in the beginning God created, there is more than we can comprehend inside that statement. When we look at the next part here, in day one, God separated the light from the darkness. There is a lot of meaning that can be going into here because we see that in day four is when he created the sun, moon, and stars. So if God created the sun, moon, and stars on day number four, then how did he create light on the first day? And so there could be many different things there. Um, the Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world. Did he create Jesus on that day? No. So did he create the sun, moon, and stars on that day? Well, no. So what is it? Is it truth and uh, good and evil? Is it That's where the separation of moral all happens. We don't know exactly, but we do know God separated and he made light separated from darkness. Was he preparing it for day number four? And that's a pretty good possibility. We go through scripture, we're going to see a little bit more that God was very organized when he created things to get things for, ready for the next step, and we'll see that further. I have this here in uh, Plot Ditch, and so you can read along if you don't have an English Bible. Um, but this is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. This is the first uh, verses 3 through 5. And these are the first verses that we're going to be looking at. And it says, God let there, said, let there be light. And God saw the light and that it was good and divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 4, it says, and God saw the light and said it was good. And so if you look at that, is that a possibility that light was visibility. It was something that you could see. And so it is, if you go based on the evidence of verses, then I believe that it is probably truly light that he created. However, later on, he only made the objects that actually lit the sun and different things like that. And before day number four, the sun was not lit, and yet God still had his own light that he had. And where was that light? We don't know. But we do know that in heaven there will be no sun, moon, and stars. And it says because there will be none needed because... God is the light. And so is that the light, the light, heavenly light that we're talking about? Maybe. Maybe God had already had that light in heaven, and he just simply introduced it into his new creation. And we continue on. The second day, we see that God separated the waters. When we think about separating the waters, that means that all the water, the sea, the clouds, everything was all run together. We know that in the beginning it says the earth was out form. Without, and it was void. When you talk about without form, that doesn't mean it was um, that it well, didn't have. Uh, it wasn't just a bunch of uh, uh, confusion. But when it say without form, that means there was no form. There was nothing that was formed. And so when we think about that, we go to day number two, and we see that God actually separated the waters. And how do we do that? God is already starting to put the ecosystem into into play where gravity pulls the water down and evaporation and all this stuff is already starting to go into play already on day number two. So it's interesting that God is putting things like water, which is something that we need, he's putting onto the, in, that into play very in the very first. And when we think about day number one, God created the heavens and the earth. When we think about the, he's putting space and matter, we're going to look at this a little further on, but you need space before you have matter. So, um, for example, if, if this storage room right next to us here, if that was room, there, if that was full, 
is completely full of supplies, there will be no room to put anything in there. So you need space before you can put something in there. And so God creates the heavens before he creates the earth. So God is perfectly ordered and doing uh, space and then matter first. And then he goes to a second phase of space and matter. And we'll look at that a little bit later on. So day number three, after he created the separated the waters and now with gravity pulling the, the water down, and we actually see in, in Job, it actually says there that God sets the bounds for the ocean, that these proud waters can only come so far and no further. And so water has now run off. Now the dry land appears. And so now day number three, now we are ready to go ahead and plant the green the trees and the flowers and the fruit and all things like that. And this is a picture of the sequoias. I don't know if I have never had the privilege of going to see the redwoods or the sequoias, and yet this is a picture of the sequoias, some of the biggest trees in the world, and it's really, really fascinating, the big things God has created, but not just the big things, but also the little things that God has created, the microscopic things. Um, I, I've studied some different bacterias and different things that they do. Uh, scientists are finding out that there are different microscopic organisms that they can use, that they attach medication to, then they inject it into you, and these little, little the microbials and bacteria, they act like little propellers. And then so they, they inject it into the bloodstream, and they simply get some medication onto it, and this little thing propels through your blood and, and, uh, and, and tra is actually a transporter. And there's different ones. There's some that kind of look like jellyfish, they have little. They, they squirt things and they move forward. And these are all super super small. And but this here is so big. These sequoia, sequoias are so big. Uh, the largest sequoia they call them General Sherman, has a volume of fifty two thousand five hundred eight cubic feet. When you think about that, I divided that up. If we would take our gym, uh, the full gym size, two hundred by one hundred. And you would take this tree and cut it into blocks of one foot squares. You would fill that whole gym up two and a half feet tall with its lumber. Or if you would take it and apply it to a piece of land that if you took and cut it into a one foot uh, square block or one square, one foot square, uh, one foot thick, it would cover almost one and a half acres of wood. And so you think about how big this tree is. You see up there that you see the Statue of Liberty, and this tree is just a few feet short of being as tall as the Statue of Liberty. But you see right next to that, you see a redwood, and that one is 369 feet tall, so it reaches far beyond the uh, Statue of Liberty that stands in New York. And the roots of the General Sherman is about, are about as wide as they are tall, and so you can just imagine the area that this, ha this tree has for a root system. I think it's fascinating. And one thing as I was studying this, I thought this was interesting, and that apples, peaches, and raspberries are all members of the rose family. And so if you ladies, I think you probably think that might be a little interesting that roses and apples and peaches and raspberries, they're all, they're all related. And so, you know, we did you like now to think from wo stom den ich in so nie weit für. Peaches and apples and raspberries, they're all part of the rose family. So let's go ahead and go to the next one. The fourth day, and I think this is probably one of my, uh, my favorite because I love stars. I love planets. I love the solar system. And years ago, I don't know if my wife, she bought me a, a, a telescope. And I learned a new way to worship God. And it's not by singing. And it's simply by looking through a telescope at the stars and at the universe and just seeing things. And on day number four, this is where God creates the sun, moon, and stars. And why, what is this purpose of sun, moon, and stars? And that is, it's a testimony. But secondly, it is in order to keep time properly. And so if we didn't have the sun or the moon, uh, we would not know how to keep time properly. And to, so now to have the sun, moon, and stars, it they rotate and they have... Uh, Perfect, perfect timing. They are not off by, by uh, any little bit. And so we see this in day number four. Uh, that's in uh, Genesis 1, verse 16. And this is some of the uh, 
some of the solar systems uh, that are out there, the star, the, the star packs that are out there, just fascinating to see the colors. And I, I worked on trying to find the clearest pictures I could find because when you put it up on a screen like this, it's just not even close to how clear it can really be. And so if someone would get the lights for this back here, not the small ones, but the big ones, then uh, you guys can see this a little better because just to see the, the Milky Way, the different parts of the stars, it's just fascinating for me. We go to the next one, and this takes really, really expensive equipment in order to capture uh, pictures like this, and it takes hours and hours of this lens, um, them filtering through different lenses in order to capture different parts of light because it's so far away. And we know that we have different kind of lights, so they use different lenses in order to capture this. But just to see some of this, it is just simply fascinating. The first time I looked through a telescope, I was just blown away. And just to see some of the colors that are out there, we look up at the stars and we see simply little bitty dots. But you start to go out there, and this one is just absolutely beautiful, just to see the color that God has created. And this is all with a bunch of stars working together and light reflecting off of each other in different angles and how they are working together to create these colors. And it's also gases that are mixed in with it. It's just simply fascinating. And when we look at some of the other things, the... the the uh, planets that are out there. Mine actually is Saturn, and that one is right there. It's got a ring around it, and that ring is simply dust and rocks. And uh, the, the best time to look through a telescope is during the winter because if you go outside and it's really, really cold, what happens is the cold weather freezes the humidity out of the air. And so the moisture drops out of the air, and so it makes, there's, there's no obstacles between you and the object you're looking at. And so one day, uh, my telescope, it would actually tell you where the objects are, and you still had to kind of find it, but it was got, got you really close. And one day, then uh, Jupiter and Saturn were clear, and we were able to zoom in on Jupiter and Saturn to the point where on Jupiter we could see the red dot on the side, and we zoomed in on Saturn, and we saw the ring around it, and the moment that I looked at Saturn and saw that ring around it, this, uh, this urge to just worship God just came up in me. It just, just to see something out there hanging there, following God's perfect order is just simply amazing, and I never, after that, Saturn became my favorite planet, but if you look at, Ju we looked at Jupiter, and Jupiter, I think, has some around 19 different moons. We have one. But Jupiter, because it's such a big planet, it has about 19 different moons. Uh, that evening, we could see four of them. Three of them on one side, following a pattern around, and one on the other side. They have to be at, at the right place for you to be able to see them, because if they're right in front of the planet, you'll never see them, because a planet is completely just lighting it up. And so they have to be off to the side, so you can see the, the reflection off the sun, off the planet, and then about off, off of the moons so that it's all uh, just right. It has to be timed right. And if you ever do look at the moon, the best time to look at the moon is not when it's a full moon, but when it's a half moon. Because then the sun is shining across the moon and it casts shadows across the moon, you see a lot more details whenever you're looking at the moon. And so it's just simply fascinating. Uh, the next one, this is a fact here. Mercury is the fastest planet in our solar system. It zips around the sun at an average of 172,000 kilometers per hour, or 107 miles per hour. And at about 65 uh, or 40,000 miles per hour faster than Earth. And so it's about uh, 88 years or 88 days a year is what it is there. I figured it out. And if that's the case, then I'd take my age and divide it by the days of our uh, our year and uh, times it by the number of days that uh, Mercury has, then I'm somewhere around 288 years old. And so, yeah, I feel a little old. But uh, just think about it. If you're there, you have a 10-year-old child here, that means then they're probably about 88 years old already. So yeah, things change a little bit. But And we go to the next one, and that is day number five. I think it's interesting that God created the fish 
and the birds on the same day. And that he created the, the uh, animals, um, elephants and giraffes and all those. He made them on day number six. But why did he make birds and fish on the same day? It almost seemed like he divided it all up into land animals and air animals and sea animals, and he created them on the same day. What's really interesting about some of these things, and we see in verse 20, in Genesis 1, verse 20, and God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that, that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. When we think about the firmament of heaven, that is the expanse, that is what is below the waters of the sea and the clouds and everything that's above. So on day number two, when God separated the waters, that he created this firmament that the birds can fly in. And I think this is probably why God did it, that he created birds and fish on the same day. And when he separated the waters, that same day he created the air. And so when he created air and water on the same day, he, he separated those two. He's also creating fish and birds on the same day to fill the water in there. And when we look at some of this stuff, God created the birds of the air and the fish in the sea. Um, we see the order of creation. God created the space, that's heavens, and then he created matter. That is all the planets, the stars, the earth, and the sun, and all those things. But then he also went to a second, a second round of creating space matter whenever he created the firmament and separated the waters, the sea, from the clouds. And then afterwards, he created the matter to put in there. And so just like he did the first heavens and earth, he also did the firmament and the animals, or I should say the birds and the fish. And uh, so I think God is very orderly in how he does things. And so I think it's fascinating just to see that God has created a very creative person, a very creative personality. Another thing I found I was thought was very interesting that catfish have up to 25, uh, 27,000 taste buds in their mouth. Humans have about 9,000. But the thing about catfish is they have about 175,000 taste buds on the outside of their family, uh, their body. So whenever they're swimming around, they can actually taste what's in their in the water with their body. And they can feel things. And what's interesting about a fish is it has a different kind of fat than human beings do. They have what they call sensory fats. We humans, we have sensitive fat, right? <laughs> but they have what they call sensory fat. In other words, the fat that they have is specially created by God in order to feel vibrations. So when you go to a lake, and I remember going to a lake and and if we ran up onto the dock, a lot of the fishermen got very upset because when you run onto that dock, that vibration of you running onto the dock scares the fish away. Many times it does because those fish are feeling that vibration in the water. So if you ever go fishing, you have a fisherman that's very sensitive, that's because he might have sensory nerves too because he's getting irritated that the fish are being sensitive. So, but. The fish, they have a special kind of fat that they can actually feel vibrations in the water from a long ways off. And this is something that even human beings have not been able to create sensors that are this sensitive simply by fat. So on the sixth day, and this is where God creates the rest of the animals, and a lot of the animals have passed away. And when we talk about evolution, that that uh, in the beginning, God did not have so many types of animals, but as things uh, continued to go, go on, that more animals came into being because they interbreed and they slowly they become more distinct in their features. Um, uh, say black dogs, white dogs, and they start interbreeding and they have different, they create different things, just like horses and donkeys and mules. Uh, all the different creations, they simply start to multiply. And so... God has created it to be that way. God is that creative. And so on day number six, that's whenever he created the animals. Now, now going back to the fish and the sensory fat, this is the, a picture of an elephant's foot. If you ever look at a, a skeleton of an elephant's foot, an elephant, actually the front legs are actually hands. They are actually considered hands. And the, the front and back uh, the hands and the feet, they walk 
on a skeleton like this. And underneath this empty part here, they have a, a fatty cushion. That fatty cushion is the same stuff that a fish has of sensory fat. Do you know that actually an elephant has some of the most sensitive feet from the, all the animals that they can sense vibrations from in the ground that no other animal can feel? An elephant, as huge as it is, as much weight that it's putting on the ground, an elephant has more sensitive feet than any other animal. Not that they are, have more painful feet, but that they actually can feel things from coming from in the ground. So that fatty cushion has a special special kind of uh, material that, that uh, vibration can transmit and move into the nerves of the elephant and that can actually feel what's going on in the ground. And so I think that's really interesting. So when you see the sixth day, we continue. Well, I'm going backwards here. And we will look at verse 24 here in Genesis 1, 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping things, the beast of the earth of his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creep upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Again and again, God always saw that it was good. Do you think God would create something and say that oh, I messed up on this one? And uh, no, God knew he's, what he was creating and that it was very good. When we look at the next part, we see in verse 26, and it says, And God created man in his image. And when we think about God created man in his image, and that is that God has created man a little higher than the animals, and yet a little bit lower than the angels. So man is between the angel and the animal. And when we think about that, we see this picture here, and I just really, I had another one that looked really good, but it was kind of blurry. Um, but we, I don't think God probably, I don't think he did it with his hands, but I think God did it with his mouth. When God creates things, he, think, he simply speaks things into existence. So do you feel like God has stopped creating things? God is simply a creator. When we think about, even when someone passes away, we say, oh, Lord, the Lord allowed it. And so many times the people can get offended. Why did God allow it? You know, God is a creator of life. God is not the creator of death. It is our unbelief and our disobedience through which death, death has come into the world. That was not God's will. But God also did not want to create robots. He wanted to have a relationship with us. And so he wanted to give us the free will to be able to have a relationship with him if we want to. And so when we think about God creating God, or man, God creating man in his image, part of that image is having the free will. And that is also having a spirit and a soul. And it's also having the intelligence far beyond what an animal has. I mean, there are fish and, and different animals, they have a lot, a lot, they're very intelligent, but not close to what a human being has. A goldfish, they have actually done tests on a goldfish that they, they took an, a goldfish and, uh, and they ran a goldfish, they put it into a tank where this fish had to get used to fly, going through an obstacle course. And afterwards, they started putting it through different obstacle courses, and they keep mix, mixing it up, and then they put that fish back into the obstacle course it had done one month earlier, and the fish instantly remembered it. So a month later, this fish knew this obstacle course off by heart. And so it's interesting that a fish has that kind of memory. Now think about whenever you go fishing and you almost get them, they're going to remember you from then on. They're going to remember that hook. They're going to remember that color or that lure. And so fish are smart, and so that's why sometimes people get frustrated if you don't catch fish the first time. But we go on to the next uh, verses here. It says in Genesis 1, 26, And God said, Let us make man. When we see, um, anytime we see God creating something, it is the word Elohim, that is the self-existing one. So if anybody ever says that God did not create things, how could God create things? Who created God? Well, that's because they are ignorant, right? Because God, the word name of God is the self-existing one. No one had to create him. He is, period. Or I should say, exclamation mark. He is, exclamation mark. He simply is. So many times we have tried to think out how does it work 
where was the beginning of God? There is no beginning of God. That's because we are limited with our thinking. One man said it this way, if you can ever figure God out, the God you figured out is not God. God is far beyond anything we can ever comprehend, anything we can ever think out. And that's the problem we have with atheists today, as they try to figure God out. The Bible doesn't teach us to figure God out. The Bible teaches us to trust God, to believe in God, obey God. He's so big. If God really is God, he's created all these things. Why would we, would we, why would we not to want to follow him? And so we look at verse 26 here, and God said, let us make man. And we look at the word us, that is plural, that's more than one. Jesus was there, we see it in John chapter 1, that without Jesus Christ, nothing was made that was made. And so he says, let us make man in our image. So we are created after the image of God and Jesus Christ. He says, in our likeness, and let, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he male and female created he them. I read a thing that says this week, this week I read it and it says this, God created male and female, Democrats created all the rest. And, and I think that's, there's a lot of truth to that. And all this was, it's not really Democrats. So many times we blame it on the Democrats. It is simply anyone that allows themselves to be used by the devil will create confusion. We can even be that too. Anytime we allow ourselves to be used by the devil, we can create confusion. Anytime we simply trust God and believe God and obey God, we will fall into perfect order with God's harmony and the way he wants to do things. So when God created all things in six days and on the seventh day he rested, have you ever thought about it? Do you really think God was tired that he wanted to rest? No, he's just simply ceased from his labors of the total creation. But that God still doesn't, that he sits around and does nothing from then on, that's not true. It's just he finished his creation. It is complete. It is finished. When Jesus died on the cross, Jesus says, it is finished. That part of his work is done. But God is still at work. Still at work. He is still working in the hearts of man. And he will always be working in the hearts of man and in the earth as long as the earth exists until he comes again. And we see this in uh, chapter 2 um, on, on the seventh day. And thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them and on the seventh day God ended his work which he made and rested on the seventh day from all the work which he made. And he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which he created, which God created and made. And so when you see that there, it says it that way. He ended the work, he finished the work, he completed the work. And that's why God rested. It's not that God stopped working and he's been loafing ever since. God is still active. God is a it's like an energetic child. He cannot stop. He is creative. He is full of energy. God is the kind of person that he always sees something to do. At this very moment, he is reading each and every one of our thoughts. At this very moment, he knows where every insect in this world is. At this very moment, God knows every insect that exists that we still, as human beings, have not found. They are still finding insects and fish and animals that they didn't know existed. God knows each and every one of those things. And God not just knows every single thought, but he knows based on the decisions we made with the thoughts that we are thinking now that where we can end up. God is not the one that controls our thoughts, but he will take our thoughts and make them a blessing. Or if we don't, we'll make them a curse. Another interesting thought, if you've ever been to Death Valley National Park, this is what you call the sliding rocks. Now, this is a flat surface. This is not sloped, but they are these sliding rocks, some of them several hundred pounds, and they find them that they continually slide. To this day, they have never been able to figure out why and how these, these rocks slide across upon the dirt. They can see trails of how these rocks simply slide. I had my own theory I think every morning when God starts the earth up, then they always move a little ways, right? 
No, it's just simply fascinating. You know why God does that? Just to remind us that he's still a few, a few steps ahead of us. Every time we think that we're caught up or a scientist thinks they're caught up to God, God allows one more thing to put, and he puts one more stumbling block in, their, in, their, in front of their foot so that they realize that God still hasn't been figured out. I like this picture. <laughs> Arguing with an evolutionist, evolution scientist is like wrestling with a pig in mud. If you're ever going to argue with an evolution scientist, you're going to realize that you are arguing on their turf based on facts. Anytime you want to talk to somebody that's an atheist, has God ever told us to argue with them based on fact? The Bible teaches us that we're supposed to present the gospel to people. We are supposed to present God's word to them. Anytime we continue to argue the word of God with people, then we are on our turf. When we look at this, then I see this here. I saw this. I've got a book at home. It's called Answers, and we got, I got it from the Creation Museum. And I saw this diagram in there, and so I looked it up, and I found it, and so I put it in here. And we look on this uh, side here and says autonomous human reasoning. And what that is is autonomous. That means that anybody can think anything they want and believe what they want to believe. And so human reasoning is open to anything. And so when we think about that, human reasoning, um, uh, if we're going to go out and as the church, we're going to try and fight them on all of these things, then we're on their turf. We're sitting up here. And we're not, we're not attacking the foundation of why they do what they do. We're up here popping their balloons, and what are they doing? They're attacking our foundation. They're attacking the Word of God. And so anytime we get off of our foundation, then we're not reasoning based on our foundation. Our foundation is the Word of God. You start arguing science with people that twist science, they're never going to believe you because that's all a matter of whatever you believe. One guy was talking to a, a lady. She was a, an atheist, and they couldn't agree on anything. They're walking on a sidewalk, and he was just trying to get them, get her to the point she would agree with him on one point. And he says, can we both agree that we are both walking on a sidewalk? She said, that's a matter of your opinion. So how far are you going to take that kind of confusion? Because in her mind, life could just be an illusion. If I poke you, if I poke you with a needle, that pain could just be an illusion. Now, when you get people to that point, why is life even meaningful? You forget why we're even here. But you go back to God's word, and all of a sudden you realize that we have a reason for being here. There's a purpose for our lives. And you go back to God's word, and we, have to, we, we, we need to go to the, the word of God, and we need to defend simply defend God's word, stand, use God's word, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we go over to a Bible verse that's here, it says Psalm 11, verse 3, it says, for if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? How are we righteous? Does the Bible not teach us that we are righteous based on faith? We believe God. Abraham believed God, and he was considered righteous. And so we as the righteous, we need to go back to believing the word of God, Forget arguing with people on these points and move forward. And so when we look at uh, some other things here, this is going with the verse I had in the very beginning in Colossians. In 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says, All things are of God, but this verse takes it a little further. It says, Who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us uh, to us the ministry of reconciliation. So Satan has taken and corrupted what God has created, and that is the heart of man. And so God has says here, I, and all things are of God, and he has reconciled us to himself. The reason you are to be saved is not just so you won't go to hell. The reason God has reconciled you is so that you can reconcile someone else. You have a reason to live. This week we had VBS. What do we do? We simply planted the word of God into children's hearts. What does the word of God do? 
the word of God produces faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and faith leads them people to repentance and so on. It's the cycle of salvation. That's how people get saved. And then they become missionaries and they become preachers and they become people that go and witness somebody that shares their testimony with others. That is how we continue to move on. And so just because God, we don't see the hands of God at work miraculously anymore doesn't mean that we are not in God's hands. When we look at this, God still has everything in his hands. Sometimes when we see everything that's going on in the world today that we can start to get afraid. But I want you to remember something. The hands that created everything, those mighty hands, is still in control today. So today, if something happens that scares you, you simply get down on your knees and you pray your prayer back into the hands of God and remember that he still has everything in his hands and trust in him. We look at this and we look at what moves forward, and that is the promise of the future. In Habakkuk 2, verse 14, it says this, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Is there any place in the sea where it is not covered with water? No. The Bible teaches us, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord one day. Can you imagine that? How many unanswered questions do you have in your mind about God, about how he did things, what he is doing? What is it about my life? But it says here, but the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. One day it's going to happen. But it's ahead of us. So we need to keep looking forward. We know, don't look down. We look forward. We keep looking at what God has created and move forward. And so this is a picture that I took when we were in Belize. This is uh, in the, on the yard of Ben Schmidt. He lives on a hill. Just absolutely stunning view. I took the picture and showed it to him. He says, that looks pretty. I said, that is your yard. He didn't even recognize his own yard. And uh, so, but it, it says here in Isaiah 58, verse 11, it says, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and he will strengthen your flame, and you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. That is God's promise to you. You might feel like sometimes that you're in a, sun-scorched land. You're, you might feel like in your life today, maybe you feel like your life is a little bit dry, but you just come back to God, and He has that living water that He can give to you, and He will continue to nourish you and give you everything you have, and that's a promise from Isaiah 58, 11. And so I would just like to close with that, and uh, we'll go ahead and close with a prayer and a song, and afterwards we will be dismissed. Let's all stand for prayer.